Good morning, everyone. It is just a few weeks away from Easter 2021. And I want to welcome you all to New Orleans Chinese Baptist Church English service. We're glad you could join us this morning. I'm going to open us up in a word of prayer. And then our brother Shop Wung will share with us, lead us in some songs of worship this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, commit ourselves fully to you. We admire your majesty and your glory. And Lord, we ask you to show us your glory this morning through your word, through our visiting with you. God, I pray that you will guide us into more truth and convict us of our sin so that we might have a full relationship with you, not hindered by any sins that creep up, sometimes unbeknownst to us. God, we welcome you in our presence this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, everyone. We're so glad you could join us today uh, to worship the Lord. The weather is really beautiful outside and you can see the Eastwoods sitting out there and enjoying the beautiful weather. So before we worship God with songs, I'm going to read us a passage from Philippians chapter 2. This is a very common passage, and this passage talks about the song that we're going to sing. It's from verse 8 through 11. Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. And he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the Bible says that there is no other name in heaven and on earth that is greater than the name of Jesus. So let us proclaim the, the greatness of Jesus, our Lord, by singing this song, No Other Name. There is no other name in heaven can be found through whom we are redeemed, through whom your grace abounds.
Thank you, Sop, for preparing those songs and the truth of those songs. Do we really believe that sin and the forgiveness of sin is the biggest issue for every man on the face of this earth? I heard that in a, a message I was listening to this morning, and it really made a good point because we have lots of issues in life. Uh, people, they could be addicted to drugs or alcohol or um, have serious mental issues, physical maladies. And so obviously, there are many things that plague us. 
and that we seek help from, whether from self-help books or physicians, psychologists or counselors. But even if we solved all those issues through our med medicine and through our science and technology, would that be enough? And the message of the entire Bible and of humanity is that no, it's not enough. The biggest issue that men and women, boys and girls face is sin. And the forgiveness of sin only comes through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to talk this morning from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. But before that, we have a few announcements. And I'm going to share them. We have some exciting announcements. First, a welcome to all of you who are with us this morning faithfully. We are very happy that more and more people are becoming vaccinated. And who knows, maybe even our number will come up next, even though we are young, they are making it more available. Just this last week, someone from our church, a doctor, sent out a message that even from 18 years and up now, you can get the virus if you have any number of things, like if you've been a smoker, or our smoker, or if your BMI is 25 or higher, um, things like that. I read it and none of the things apply unless I am large enough. Now I haven't gone and tested my BMI. If I am large enough, I might qualify to get it. But then someone else said, just tell them you're a pastoral staff and um, they'll give it to you right away. And so one way or the another, whether I need to eat a couple Big Macs before I head over there, or from the church, I should be able to get a vaccine soon. All right, but we do have some exciting announcements this morning. I'm going to put the best one first, in my opinion. Everyone is invited to a New Orleans Chinese Baptist Church English service Easter picnic potluck. Now, if you don't know what a potluck is, it's an amazing thing. Everyone brings some dish. Hopefully it's something that you are good at making. Don't practice on your brothers and sisters at the church, make something for the very first time ever and you decide, I didn't even taste it. You guys taste it, tell me what you think. No, that's not what you wanna do. You make something that is the best for you. Now, we have some great cooks in our church. One of them will be providing ham and dinner rolls and drinks. It's up to everyone else to provide the other things. Now, some things I've eaten from people at our church, dumplings or jiaozi. I've had some awesome dumplings from some members of our church. I hope one of them will attend this potluck dinner. Other things, um, spring rolls, Chinese spring rolls. Now, I didn't have many of these in China, but some of the best ones I've had have been right in here in New Orleans from some people from our church. I don't know what your specialty is or what you like to make. Think about that. You have a few weeks. It'll be April 4th, 1 o'clock p.m. on the campus of NOBTS. Now, you look in the picture, you can see the Eastwoods there in the picture. That is the location where our picnic will be, weather permitting. If not, we'll be under a pavilion, uh, a big uh, outdoor pavilion. It'll be nice, hopefully. But that's where we're going to be. It's going to be a nice time. We will still be socially distanced, but there's lots of space here on campus. And I'm looking forward to that ever since I heard this announcement. Okay, um, bring a long chair or a picnic blanket. Um, there are some, uh, if, if we're at where I'm thinking, you wanna bring a long chair, picnic blanket. If it's raining, we'll be under a pavilion and there are picnic tables there. But um, bring that anyway and we should be good to go. I hope as many of you can come as are able. If you're not a member of our WhatsApp group, please email us, nocbckinner at gmail.com. Include your name, telephone number. We'll add you to the list so you can get either updates, devotionals like Uncle Cookie shared yesterday, and announcements just like our Easter potluck um, dinner. Prayer requests. As usual, we're going to have a time at the end of the service after the recording stop. 
you can unmute your mic and share that request verbally. Or anytime throughout the service, you can type it in using uh, the chat feature on Zoom, and we will pray for those together at the end. Team Kid and prayer meeting, still ongoing, Friday nights, Wednesday nights. The Zoom IDs are on the screen, and I encourage you to participate in those, or for your kids to participate as it happens. Giving, we have the privilege to support ministries through the gifts that we give as a portion of what God has graciously given us. We know that every good and perfect gift comes down from our Father in heaven. And this morning, I'm going to ask Brother David Lee to lead in our prayer for our tithes and offerings. You can see the address Let's on the screen. Pray. Dear God in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful spring day. We thank you for the, the flowers, the fresh leaves, the fresh air that we breathe. We thank you for the protection we had for the past uh, 12 months during the pandemic. We thank you for the rapid implementation of the vaccines. We've seen changes out there. We've seen hope out there. Above all, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. This period of time right before he says this, remember that our Lord died for us in order to rescue us. He gave us the best gift we ever had, the best gift we ever need. Thank you for this blessing. Thank you for the peace that you give us in these times of fear. Lord, grant us a cheerful heart that are willing to give back, to help your ministry, to participate in your ministry and your plan to save all the souls of this, on this earth. So give us this cheerful heart. Give us, let us give our money, 10% or even more. Give our effort. Give, above all, give our heart, our entire focus on you, Lord Jesus, that we can, give, that we can participate with you and with all the brothers and sisters in our church and with all the Christians around the globe to spread your gospel and to spread your love. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother David, for leading us in prayer. And I enjoy what David prayed because it's so true. We give a tithe or more, and I hope you don't just give a tithe of your uh, effort or just give a tithe, 10% or more of your heart. You give, we give our whole effort. We give our entire focus. We give our entire heart into the effort of the mission that God has called us to as his sons and daughters. And that must be our focus. And we have to be reminded of it regularly or we just lose track. And Things that are not the main things tend to become the main things. And the main things tend to grow smaller and fade out of sight unless we continually remind ourselves of what is the main thing. As an introduction to the message this morning, I'm gonna share a little story. In college, I worked at Sam's Club. Everyone knows, or most people know, Sam's Club is the wholesale sister of Walmart. Both of them were started by Sam Walton, or at least Walmart was. Maybe Sam's Club came a little later, but um, Sam Walton was the founder of Walmart. He learned a lot about service in his life. And now if, if you work at Sam's Club or you go in there, you're not a customer. Okay, you have to get the terminology right. I worked there for several years. You're a member, okay? because you pay a membership fee and you're not a customer. No one who works at Sam's Club will ever call you a customer. They're gonna call you a member and treat you with the respect that your money and your membership deserves. Now, some things we learned about service as, as I was working there is, if someone comes in and asks a question, hey, where's this, where's that? You don't just say, oh, it's way, it, it's over there. Look at aisle number 10, aisle number 12. Now you'll get that at some stores. 
it should never happen at Sam's Club. When you walk into Sam's Club and you say, where's this? We are trained, or I was trained, to say, let me take you there. And you're gonna walk that person, that member, all the way exactly to the thing that lo they're looking for and say, is there anything else I can help you with? That's your first stop. It doesn't mean, it doesn't matter if you are stocking something, if you are on your way to grab something, no, you help that member first. And then you do what you were going to do after that. You greet people as they come in. You help people load their cars with their stuff. As you know, or if you've ever gone to Sam's Club, they don't have plastic bags there. And I thought, man, this is so weird. What are people gonna do? Well, usually you have some boxes because it's a wholesale. You're going through cardboard boxes all the time. Usually these boxes, they may have holes in them. There's like lids missing and stuff. People grab these boxes and they're stuffing their milk or other things in it. Anyway, they're kind of unwieldy at times and you need some help. If you're out there pulling the carts in and you see someone who needs help, you put those carts aside and you help them load their carts. Service. It was what Sam Walton wanted all his associates. They're not even, you're not even an employee. You're called an associate. All their associates to have ingrained in their ethos, in their, who they are. Sam Walton was a service driven life. All right, now I, I wanna use this kind of analogy as Christians, we are gospel driven. But at the, at the same point, I, I forgot to tell a story. When I was in Sam's Club, associates, we have these competitions or you're recognized. Maybe someone said, that person did a great job serving me. Well, the supervisors are supposed to take note and they'll bring that up. You'll get free gifts. You'll get free gift certificates and coupons. And one, one day I won at our little meeting and I got a book. Of course, you know, if you win a book at Walmart, what kind of book are you going to win? Well, it's a book about Sam Walton. Who else? And so I actually read this book and it was pretty amazing, his life and how he came to value service. Okay, all this to say, no matter if you work in Sam's Club, you read the book about Sam Walton, you know all about a service-oriented life, unless you actually put these principles into practice, you're not going to live up to the standard of a service-driven life. Likewise, you can go to church. You can even be a Christian and have committed to follow Jesus and accepted his um, salvation from sins. You can read the Bible, but if you don't actively remind yourself, put these things into practice in your daily life, make it your focus, you won't have a gospel-driven life. And so the message this morning from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I hope you'll turn there. It's about having a gospel-driven life. Three things I'll share, but first we're going to read the text this morning. I'll read it out loud. Hopefully you'll follow along either on the screen or in your Bibles. This is from the New International Version. Therefore, since through God's mercy, we have this ministry. We do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, he talked about this last week, chapter 3, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age, that is Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts 
to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Last three verses. Therefore, we do not lose heart. He said that already in verse one, here again. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Let's pray. Dear God, I pray through your word, which is alive, it's active, and it discerns even our thoughts, motives, intentions. May you build us up to be more like Christ this morning. Give us ears to hear, minds to understand, wills to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Three things. I got S's today. So serving, if you want to have a gospel-driven life, serving, not being served. Suffering, but growing. Really, the focus there is on growing, no matter the physical suffering or persecution challenges. And third, seeing. Not just seeing with your physical eyes, seeing, but not understanding but seeing beyond these five senses, faith, seeing what's unseen, the spiritual realm, and keeping that as the um, center of how you act, what you do through your lives, the decisions that you make, focusing on what's eternal and not what's right in front of our eyes, money, possessions, um, these kinds of things. All right, so first, serving, not being served. Jesus said, I have come not to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. In our passage, right at the beginning, he says, we have this great privilege, this ministry. It's a ministry of grace, not law, like Moses's law. It's a ministry of mercy, not cruelty. Um, this mercy, this ministry breeds endurance. He says, don't lose heart. But also this ministry that he, we've been given, it has to do with speaking. We don't just, and we talked about this even in previous weeks from 2 Corinthians, we also speak. And how do we speak? Well, <clears throat> we renounce these secret and shameful ways in Early Christianity, there were some problematic uh, groups. One of them was Gnostics, Gnosticism. They believed secret knowledge. Even today, there are people that say, hey, there's these secret Bible codes. If you don't know these Bible codes, when you read the Bible, my computer program can find these codes 
and they predict things throughout history. And, and uh, if you don't have these, you're really missing something from the gospel. Same kind of thing back then, this kind of secret esoteric knowledge that Jesus passed down through certain disciples. They're not recorded in the Bible, and you have to join our group to get this secret knowledge and to have a full relationship with God, this kind of stuff. Um, Paul says he renounced those secret and shameful ways. I think it does refer to that kind of um, teaching. If you have something, you go to some Bible study, and you're hearing things that you've never heard before that sound just a little bit uh, off, there's a good chance they are a little bit off. And sometimes they can be really dangerous. We renounce those things. We don't use deception. We don't distort the word of God. Most cults that come along use the word of God, and they'll turn to some passage in scripture. Eastern lightning is one that's been um, popular among the common people in China. They'll turn to some passage and say, hey, you know, this woman who was kneading the dough and the yeast and all, well, this is a picture of something that it's not really a picture of. And they use these scriptures distorting God's word to have their own little um, secret groups and um, concepts that aren't really supported by the Bible. Instead of that, we plainly speak. We commend everyone to their conscience before God. We're not using some sophisticated art of oratory or rhetorical skill, although I think we should say things that aren't, um, we, we should try to practice speaking in acceptable grammar. And so we can be understood and using uh, things. We don't wanna distract from God's word because of our own um, weaknesses or lack of preparation. But at the same time, we don't want to use motives or appeal to people's motives that aren't really what God um, appeals to. Salvation, we can see there's nothing we can do. Now, these verses, the God, verse four, the God of this age, you can notice in most of your Bible translations, if it says that, it's a small g. That's an interpretation. It's an accurate interpretation. The God of this age is not uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. The God of this age here, this world system here on earth is Satan. And he has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Now, you might think, oh, if God's more powerful than Satan, how does Satan have the power to blind people's minds so that they can't see the gospel? Why doesn't God just destroy Satan? And then there won't be this obstruction blinding people's uh, minds. That's a good question. Why doesn't God just eliminate cancer? Why doesn't God eliminate thunderstorms or hurricanes and all these things? Part of the reason for all these is sin has come in and corrupted uh, natural order. Satan has been allowed to sin against God and still have some existence. Now, we know in the end, God is going to cast Satan and the Antichrist, the false prophet, into hell. They will never again um, tempt human beings, but for this current time. It's part of God's will that they are allowed some power here on earth. Now, does that power keep some people from, from seeing the glory? No. And the reason comes in the next few verses. But we do know without God, Satan blinds everyone, unbelievers, so they can't see the gospel. Now, the image of God, you might have heard the expression imago dei. That's Latin for the image of God. And you see that right here in the Greek. The Latin translation would obviously say imago dei. But Jesus is the very imprint of God, personality and power and glory that's imprinted um, on Jesus. And in the Old Testament, when you see Moses, who is 
speaking with God as a man speaks face to face and his face is radiating this glory after speaking with God. That same kind of glory is right in Jesus, it abides in Jesus. And um, Satan blinds people's eyes. Now, does that mean there's no hope for these unbelievers? If that were the case, then there would have been no hope for any one of us who are gathered together this morning. No. Um, Jesus, God, shines light into people's hearts. This overcomes any blindness that Satan has over people. Um, people. God, if we look in the Old Testament, he says, let there be light. And there was light. Boom. In the same way, God says, let there be light. And light overpowers the darkness, as we also read in John 1, first chapter. Same thing with unbelievers. They're blinded by Satan, but God's light shines. His glory shines. Now, people can reject the light. They can turn and harden their hearts like Pharaoh did when God said, let my people go worship me. Pharaoh hardened his heart. And also, God hardened his heart. It was both and. Satan can blind people. God's light can overpower that, blind, that blindness, that power of Satan. But people can still, with their stubbornness, refuse God's light. Now, in spite of <clears throat> all this, I, I do want to focus. We're serving. We're speaking the truth in love. We're not here to be served. Also, we're here to grow, no matter the external circumstances. Now, things are not always as they appear. Some of you, maybe kids, will see this image right here, and you'll, see, and you'll know exactly what it is. This image is of that old woman who came to the prince in the story, Beauty and the Beast. Now, she came and did the um, prince acknowledge this woman? No. Oh, it's a hideous old woman. Close the door. Um, don't do what she says. But things on the outside are not always as they seem on the inside. She was actually this beautiful enchantress. And because of the prince, prince's insolence, she cursed him and made him into this hideous beast. And, and unless he has someone help uh, fall in love with this hideous beast before all the petals of this rose fall off, then he will remain a beast forever. All right, that's the story there. And things are not always as they seem on the outside. And I'm going to get to the point here, but Sam Walton, this guy was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. But you know what he drove? He didn't buy some fancy car. He drove this pickup truck. You can still go see the pickup truck that he drove. I think it's in Bentonville, Arkansas. That's the home office of Walmart and Sam's Club. He drove this pickup truck all around and he would go visit the, the different Walmarts that he started. He didn't drive his Hummer. I don't think there were Hummers back then. He didn't drive his Lamborghini, his Ferrari, his uh, special car. No, he kept driving this old pickup truck. And he usually wore his hat that said Walmart on it. And he went, he didn't live like he really, like the wealth that he had. It's the same thing with us. We have this great treasure, this gospel, this ministry, this uh, light that God's given us, but it's in jars of clay. What are jars of clay? They're fragile. They break. Why do we live in such fragile bodies? We could get a disease or COVID. Some people did, and they were dead a week later. Why? Our bodies are temporary, and they deteriorate, if not from disease, from age, and eventually we die. But while we're still alive, sometimes we'll go through 
very difficult times. Paul describes his personal experience. He was hard pressed. He was perplexed. He was persecuted. He was struck down, but he was not grounded. He was always helped by God. But that's not the main point. The point is on the inside, in spite of all these things that were happening on the outside, he was growing in his relationship with God. His power with God and with men was growing. Uh, Rocky Balboa, Philadelphia. This is a story, of course, but he, no matter, he was this boxer. He was just an average guy, but he worked so hard and um, he eventually took on the world champion and beat him, okay? But the point was, no matter how beat up he was, no matter how much he got hit in the face, hit in the body, uh, fell down, he wasn't out. We have this expression in English, I'm down, but not out. It comes from boxing. They may knock you down, but they didn't knock you out. And he always got back up before he was down, knocked down a third time. Now, in boxing, you're down three times, you're out. He always got back up and he won. That's the same kind of image that Paul has. We're not down, but we're not out. And why is it this way? It's so that the life that God has given us may be revealed in our mortal body. God gets all the glory. If, if this mortal body that's so weak can display God's glory, and we can have a different perspective on life, then other people will see God's glory through us and praise God for how we live in spite of our external physical circumstances. And if we have this relationship with God, we do speak because we know that resurrection, life eternal, is real and we live accordingly we don't put our faith and hope and our effort into temporary things and the result is that the glory of god may reach more and more people and they will become his sons and daughters through faith repentance now lastly seeing i don't have much time we're gonna wrap these up but to be gospel driven we're into serving people, speaking the truth in love. We're growing in spite of our external circumstances, our perhaps financial woes or physical maladies or verbal persecution, perhaps physical persecution. We're growing closer to God. Thirdly, we also see beyond the five senses. Now we have five senses. We have sight. We have um, taste, we have touch, we have um, smell. Did I mention five? We have hearing. Okay, I think that's all five. But beyond those, we have a sight that is supernatural. We have to perceive and focus our lives based on what is eternal. If we don't, we're going to waste our time, our precious time here on earth. But we don't lose heart, even though outwardly we're wasting away. Inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. All that's happening that may be bad, it's temporary, it's momentary, it's light. What's heavy? Eternity. That's what's heavy. It far outweighs. The glory from eternity far outweighs the temporary nature of things that we're going through now. Now focus on verse 18 as we close. Therefore, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what's unseen. Because what is seen is only temporary. What is unseen is eternal. We don't just look at the pros and cons based with our physical sight. Um, how is this going to help our bank account? Let's make a decision based on that. Now, it is important that we're shrewd stewards of what God's given us, but the primary thing isn't that. 
we're not concerned primarily with it. is this going to make us more comfortable? Is it going to advance us? Is it going to make us more popular with people? Is it going to help our cause, our social cause, or our political cause? No. We judge things on how, how it's going to um, affect eternity, how it's going to, um, we're going to live our lives on the perspective of God, on sin, self, repentance. Only two things are eternal. I heard this a lot when I was growing up, the word of God and the souls of people. Now, if that's true, our lives should reflect that. We see people all around us when we go out. It's an eternal soul. We see someone who's homeless. That's an eternal person whose spirit and body after they're resurrected will either spend eternity in heaven or in hell. How do our actions reflect this truth? If we're acting like other things are eternal, possessions, professional advancement, status, well, then our perspective needs adjustment. Now, one final illustration. Here you can see there's a casket. There's also a fork. Now, a woman was diagnosed with a terminal illness. This is gonna happen through life. We're gonna have friends, family, parents. We're going to be diagnosed with a terminal illness. You know, time is limited before they pass away. She was getting her things in order, and she asked her pastor to come to her house and discuss some of her final wishes. Now, she told him the songs she wanted to be sung at her funeral. She told him the scriptures that she would prefer to be read at her funeral. She also said the outfits she wanted to be buried in. And she wanted to be buried with her favorite Bible. Okay, these are kind of normal. Maybe not the outfit, but these are kind of normal things to talk with your pastor. But she said, there's one other thing. I want to be buried with a fork in my right hand. Now, that's one of the weirdest things I've ever heard. But for her, she wanted to be buried with a fork in her right hand. Now, we're going to have a potluck dinner, April 4th. I hope everyone can come. But this woman's... Um, illustration as you if you would her dying wish to be buried with a fork in her right hand had some meaning and this was her explanation she said in all my years of attending church socials and potluck dinners when the dishes of the main course were being cleared someone would inevitably say keep your fork it was my favorite part of the meal because I knew something better was coming like velvety chocolate cake or deep dish apple pie, whatever your favorite dessert is, keep your fork. Don't throw that fork away, dessert's coming. And this was her illustration. She wanted people, when they get to her casket and they ask, what? Why does she have a fork in her right hand? She wanted the pastor to tell them, keep your fork. The best is yet to come. Eternity. Keep your focus on what is yet to come. Let our lives, our actions be driven by the gospel and by the realities of what's eternal and not live for what's temporary. Let's not get to the end of our lives and say, I worked so hard for something that I left behind or for something that um, will waste away. Let's not do that. Have a gospel-driven life. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that you would burn the truth of your message from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 on our, lot, on our hearts. May we be focused in our living and not waste the precious time you've given to us on this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll turn it over to Shop. He's going to lead us in a final song. Then we have prayer requests. You can go ahead and type those prayer requests in the chat room or be ready to unmute and share in just a minute.
hitting point to check the score. Very good. Let's hope all our players are okay. To close our service, uh, let us sing this song, Goodness of God. So, so good. With every breath. 